This episode of Gather Geeks is sponsored by Leo Events. The impact of live events is undeniable, but for now, the destination is digital. While Leo Events can plan and produce virtual events alongside any credible platform provider, the agency developed an exclusive proprietary platform that is proven, customizable, and ready to deploy. Learn more at leoevents.com. Welcome to Gather Geeks, a podcast by BizBash, the place where people passionate about meetings and events come together. Here's your host, BizBash chairman and founder, David Adler. Today we have an important conversation about saving our industry at a critical time. 12 million people and thousands of small companies and large companies connected with all aspects of the event ecosystem are looking for a lifeline. With no good news to report, I thought it would be helpful to hear from some of our advocates who are trying their best. Remember in May, we all thought that everything would be in the upswing in the fall and that help would be on the way. Of course, it didn't happen, but that moment birthed action from at least two organizations that started from scratch because they knew we needed to be heard. Our guests today are event experience designer, Philip DeFour, who is the president and creative director of the DeFour Collective, representing the Live Events Coalition. And representing Go Live Together, we have its manager and SVP of corporate strategy of the Freeman Company, Sue Sung. So combined, these groups represent all of those people in that event ecosystem, including event organizers, venues, caterers, photographers, fabricators, entertainers, artists, speakers, transportation companies, drivers, designers, graphic artists, security people, technologists, waiters, chefs, coat check workers, salespeople, and hundreds of others who are impacted by the event world. So let's listen to Sue and Philip and get an update. So. We're with this incredibly esteemed panel that you just heard about. Sue um, and Philip, what is going on now? We're in the third, we're in the fourth week of August. Uh, tell us what the plan is and also what the expectations have been. And what are you, are we, are we depressed? Are we optimistic? How do we sort of figure out what to do next? Because I think the key question is, what now? So I ask you, I'm asking you, what now? Don't Do you, all jump in. <laughs> okay. um, well, I will tell you um, that from uh, the Live Events Coalition perspective, which in our, our hope is that we, through all this, become one entity all speaking together, um, we are now focused on some legislation that has been sitting on the Hill um, when they decided to take a break and go home. Um, so uh, the House does not come back until the 14th and the Senate comes back on the 8th. So there are some, uh, what we're now doing is pressuring members of Congress and the Senate while they are home, because they're all home, because it's an election season. Um, and there are some specific pieces of legislation, the Restart Act, the extension of PPP, the PUA um, extension as well, which is a $600 um, a week unemployment that many of us know about. And then the SBA loans, which is uh, making 7A loans easier for people not specifically in our industry, but covers a lot of our in industry um, to access. Um, and specific, we need people to go after Senator Cardin, not go after, but really communicate with Senator Cardin and Senator Rubio, who are the co-chairs of the Small Business Committee in the Senate. Um, and we have a you join letter that I'll actually reference and tell you where to, you can find it on our website, um, liveeventscoalition.com. Um, but we need to really need people to actually push that and, and really really reach out to their members of Congress, even if they're not specifically in those states or in those committees. Um, because once these folks go home and they start to hear from constituents that this is now really affecting them in a really bad way, um, when you look at uh, people's unemployment running out, when you look at businesses like all of us in the live events and the, and the uh, industry, we can't go back to work until there is some kind of vaccine or there is some kind of uh, effective treatment. Um, so it really is about putting pressure on them to do their jobs. And um, we know from being in D.C. and we know from years, years and years and years of work um, on the Hill, they listen when people reach out to them. In the old days, it was phone calls um, and letter writing. Um, those have just been turned to, you know, uh, social media communications and things like you join. 
Sue, are you in the same place or are you, is, is your organization taking a different approach? Um, uh, s similar. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, we're all in this together. And so when, when we started Go Live together, it was really to amplify work that, that already existed. So, um, you know, we were aware of the Live Events Coalition, spoke with them from the beginning. It was amazing, the grassroots campaigning they had done. Um, we had always been focused on um, recovery uh, for the business events industry, um, not because relief wasn't important, but when Go Live got started, CARES had just gotten passed. Um, you know, we knew there were a lot of people who were very much focused on um, then, you know, PPP and the Main Street lending loans, and then obviously the supplemental. Now, as you know, when we started, we thought fall you know we we just need to make it till fall shows right. are going to restart in fall right? right now now we're staring down labor day and it's like oh my god if shows can just open at the beginning of the year we'll be happy and so um you know so we've had to evolve as as things have evolved so a hundred percent um you know aligned with philip we're hearing the exact same things you know it's disappointing i i a couple things. I, I don't have a background in advocacy. I am totally new to this, um, but I've spoken with over two dozen offices um, so far. And, um, you know, I, I, I do believe they have a genuine desire to help. Um, I do believe they do want to hear from constituents. Um, a lot of our challenge in the business events industry has been just to educate them on the complexities of our industry. Um, just got off a call where it's like, you know, something is simple as a cleaning credit, you know, you give it to a restaurant, you get it and you understand where the benefit is. Now we're going into, well, you can give it to the convention center, but then you've got the show organizer and then you've got the suppliers and they all might be bearing a greater than average load of expense that isn't quite so clean, you know, versus, versus, um, versus a restaurant. So helping them understand all the people and businesses that work behind the scenes in order to affect this industry has, has been um, very eye opening for everyone. Well, one of the things that you, that I think that everyone pivoted from was we were being lumped together with these huge consumer events. Yeah. Why did you decide to separate yourself, and and how do you explain that to a uh, to a legislator or someone that's going to ask for we're going to ask for help? So business events are controlled events. They're controlled gatherings. They're not mass gatherings, and we're not calling them consume. You know, we're not. Um, we're we're separating them more from public gatherings, um, but really we're really the distinction is mass gathering. I want to be careful about um, using the word consumer or. Um, those kinds of events, because there are a lot of Comic-Con is probably the most popular example. That's a consumer event, <laughs> right? But but it but it exists to transact commerce. It exists to put buyers and sellers together. It exists for movie theaters and studios to promote their movies. And, you know, and, and they make an attractive product for attendees to come and, and really kind of, you know, um, feed that cycle. So I just want to be very mindful of that. But, but you're, you're, are you saying that that's a controlled uh, environment But that's well? a controlled environment. Because so if, if you think about it, you come into a convention center. The average convention center is 300,000 square feet. From the beginning, from the invitation till the time that you get in, we can control for um, online registration, so you don't have to stand in line. We can design the queuing so you're not right on top of each other. We can design the flow of the exhibition hall. We can design the time of the speakers. We can design the location of the speakers. So everything to maximize social distancing, to, to enhance and communicate safety standards that you can't do in a concert, for example, where you know you have to use different moves for a concert because you're putting general public together in a confined space for a set period of time, right? So it's a very different environment that you're working in and, you know, you have to adapt differently than when you're in a business event, which is controllable and we can actually do everything, not only the layout and the timing, but we have real time technology that already existed for when crowds are assembly, you know, are, are gathering in a particularly popular exhibit, we can get real time access to that and break it up because they're not all at the same place consuming the same content at the exact same time. So it's very different. I mean, a lot of the events that, that Philip does also are controlled as well. So I assume that there's a lot of similarities between uh, the, the, the acts. Yeah, I, I would for sure say that we are 
95% of what we do um, are controlled events. I mean, when you look at a gala, it's completely controlled from invitation to access to walk in the door. When I do a thousand person event at the Anthem for the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, um, I know everyone who comes in that door. We have electronic check-in so we can check and see how many people are coming in at what time. We can yes. space people apart. We space tables apart. Um, we know access from the back. So they're, they're actually, they're, as you know, the funny saying is same, same, but different. Um, they really are the same thing. And, and if you look at what we had to do in the beginning as well, was really educate members and even our own industry as to who we were. Because mm-hmm. what we do is behind the scenes. People don't know who we are. And so when you start to put numbers to that, like 12 million people by, by the smallest estimate as to the number of people in our industry alone um, and the number of people who've already closed businesses because of that. And if you look at um, you look at concerts, you look at your industry, you look at ex- exhibitions and in our mind, we're all just different verticals under the same umbrella. And so that's why for us, it's so important that we all work together. The communications campaign that we put together to really influence Congress was designed that all verticals could use it. Wish I was there, right? You wish you were, while you wish you were networking at a business event, we wish we were getting a paycheck. While you wish you were celebrating, we wish we had health insurance because we're all in the same boat. So, but the thing is, the public side, is someone advocating for the public side and is it a different argument or is it the safety argument? I don't know. How that do you, it's how do you argument, sort of... David, and I think for us, what, and I think what, what Sue would agree with, we're not asking for safety measures to be, you know, sped up or to, to be inadequate. We're not asking for people to open up right now. I mean, there was an article, um, David, that I shared with you about that wedding in Maine that was 360 people, which was well above what the, the local health officials had said they could do. Um, and 52 people from that wedding have tested positive and they've been able to trace. And now there's one person who wasn't even at the wedding, but was exposed by somebody who was, who has died. So um, I think the larger events are um, there. The big public events, I think will be uh, in, a, in a, they're in a different boat, but they're not, if, if that makes sense. I'm, I, I know I'm not making sense there. But, but I would yeah. say that our, our, our world, our industry, when we see people that want to jump in early and start up, I mean, there's sort of this conundrum that we have that we don't want to f- go fast uh, and that are we not advocating for our industry because we're doing that? Some people think that. I mean, I look, I think um, we are not. And as, as an association or a coalition, we are not. Um, I think we get that everybody wants to get back to work. We all do. Um, we miss our livelihoods. Um, but I think doing these things unsafely only make it worse for us and prolong a reopening in different places. So I think, you know, look, even before this happened, safety um, for our uh, guests at every event we do is paramount. I mean, it's a big part of our staff briefing. Um, when we do, you know, like a 3000 person event for the, for MLB, Major League Baseball, you know, safety was a huge, you know, we had, we had a complete separate committee who did nothing but safety around that event. And how we took care of entrances and exits and how we made sure there were enough restrooms and, uh, you know, first aid, all those things that safety is a paramount to any of us. that do. But what, but what is the between both of you? I um, mean, I've had discussions with others about the event industry and they don't think that we're going to be safe until testing is universal and fast and quick. Is that what do you think about that? Is that going to be that we know we're going to be better. Well I, mean, like, we- first. <laughs> well, I mean, I think context matters, right? I mean, I would rather go into a convention center that has 30 or 40 foot ceilings that have fresh air being piped from the outside, that is adhering to social distancing, has all the signage, has the PPE, has the compliance, has incentives for those compliant, you know, for that compliance, than being in a situation where none of that is controlled for, or very little of that is controlled for, and none of it is being adhered to. I mean, we just, I mean, I recently had, we went out to dinner with friends, and we actually chose to sit indoors because we had the entire indoor space to ourselves with open windows, than being right on top of each other in an outdoor patio. <laughs> so, you know, I think, I think. Um, you know, as Philip said, 
look, we want to get our people back to work as quickly and safely as possible. In order to do that, we need to have a sustained reopening. If we were, you know, if we were that main situation, I mean, that would shut us down for longer than we, you know, than than is necessary. And so knowing that, knowing that every party in our ecosystem has that incentive to do the right thing, I think is also the thing that separates us from public events. <laughs> we are all truly in this together and we all have incentives to make sure that we're all doing it safely. What happens when you go and you see a ballroom filled with people like it was, you know, 2019 <laughs> and it's public. I mean, it, it, it is not good for our industry. I mean, the idea that you mean, you mean we're all in it together now filled up like right now. Yes. Right now. Let's say, I mean, some, some ballrooms or people are still doing it. I mean, it, you know, there puts a black eye on our, on our industry. Well, yeah. And there's, uh, the, there's the case in New York that where they sued the governor, um, the venue did because two people wanted their weddings to be it. They wanted the 50% rule for restaurants applied to venues um, which, you know, one case won, the other, I think, went back to court. I, I don't think it's good for us. I, I don't think, I think we have to be, as Sue said, really careful about how we have to show, first of all, that we, we know how and we can reopen safely, that we can gather people together and we can do it safely. We can take precautions. We can advise. We can, we can be the model of how a lot of this happens even in other industries. Um, so I think it's incumbent upon us to be the leaders and to be the examples. Um, I, I don't think rushing back, I, I think a ballroom right now filled up in some space, wherever that is. I mean, you look at, you know, political rallies recently that were held in, in an open forum with no masks, no nothing, and people got sick. And so I don't think any of us are advocating for that. We would never advocate for that. And now a quick word from our sponsor, Leo Events. Despite the disruption, the best brands carry on. And for now, the destination is digital. Driven by purpose, platform, and people, let the team at Leo Events deliver impactful virtual moments for your audience. Visit leoevents.com today to discover Leo's virtual capabilities and read case studies from recent programs. So let me go into the, the objections that you're getting from the lobbying. Is it, are we just, you know, when you go into a senator's office or congressman's office or a legislator, they're they're the best event organizers on the planet. They're their main skill main skill set is event organizing. What, how do they react? Are they just thinking of us as the stepchildren, or they just don't understand it? No, no, no. I, actually, I think as I was reminded by the folks that we're working with on the Hill, you know, this is not a normal way legislation is made. Right? This is not the normal back and forth process to begin with. So the CARES Act. All those things, you know, are basically being decided by a very small number of people. And I don't think our our encounters have not been that we don't think you're important. We think you're we'll get to you in a year. I think they're trying to manage all of this together. And so what we've been what has been helpful for us in the beginning was once we started putting numbers to what it is we do. Right. And once they understood we have 12 million people and to Sue's point earlier, when we talk about, we refer to it as an event ecosystem. So when an event for a thousand people gets canceled or gets put on, it's not just the the producer and the caterer and the lighting company. It's everything that each of those companies does and beyond. So the caterer hires all these 1099 workers for two days to prep all the food. They hire um, the, the, the rental company hires all of the people to unload the trucks and clean the dishes. Um, the, the valet guy has to hire attendants. Um, the florist has to hire 1099 workers to make all of the, the, the arrangements that got ordered from a wholesaler that got ordered from a farm. So it's this exponential effect that once we started to tell that story to them, then they really started to listen. And it, it's just, I think people don't know until you tell them. And like with Sue's industry, uh, I mean, we're all in the same industry, but you know, it's the same thing. If she, about an exhibit or a business event, it, it's, it's all those people. It's the people that scan the tickets. It's the people that can't, can't even agree more. We spent a good, good couple months working with um, Sears economists and EIC's economists and U.S. Travels economists. And you know, to, to Philip's point, not only are we talking about the total impact, which we had at, at a trillion dollars for the direct and indirect, but um, on a business on a business event, um, 
you know, the exhibitors are there to transact commerce. And for many folks, and, you know, we we have 1.4 million out of the 1.7 million exhibitors are small businesses. They're less than 500 employees. Almost half of small businesses rely on a business event or attend a business event every year and, and need it for their revenues, right? And so that impact, um, you know, the, the data is a little spottier there. Um, I've seen it as high as a 28 times return, but the economists tell us that, you know, an average of, of four to seven is is a reasonable expectation in terms of the return on investment. That's an additional half a billion dollars. I mean, just just that, that because that event existed, that doesn't exist now. And so completely agree. We are telling this as this is a small business stimulus package. We need to exist for these small businesses who are going to be hurting coming out of this pandemic. They're not going to have the wherewithal to spend the tens of thousands of dollars to attend these events that their larger competitors can. And it's going to put them that further, that much further behind in their growth, in their innovation, in their ability to create more jobs down the line. And so, you know, as Philip said, I can't underscore it enough. You know, this absolutely goes beyond just a one time, you know, here and now. It just the, the 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 ripple effect throughout all the economies, and especially the local economies. When you think about, um, you know, the states have been decimated in trying to fight this pandemic. We create, you know, our businesses create the tax revenues that the state and local economies desperately need, and so, you know, we we should they've been very responsive and they do get it. I mean, it's been a bit of an education for them, but they absolutely understand how we can help in, in the recovery and not just, you know, um, uh, just benefit directly for ourselves. And that's kind of it. And I think we're, I think, I think we're going to get it in a sense that we have a self-esteem issue in our own industry. That right. We don't realize how important we are. Right. And, and I, I would say one of the other things that piqued some interest in one of the, the things that we tried to do with uh, on the Hill and what we've been trying to do with the social media campaign is actually to tell the story, to put those faces behind those numbers that Sue and I talk about. When you look at um, and then we did um, a case study around it's the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. Again, the event I mentioned, mentioned at Anthem, um, that is an event when that does not happen. That much like Sue's business ma- or business events that tra- are transactional, that's a nonprofit gala, which is super transactional, right? So they they rely on raising. Last year they raised three point two million dollars at that event, and that money goes directly to caregivers of people in the military caregivers. So families around this country who are now saddled with someone in their home who might be 23 years old, who's now living at their house and they're caregiving for them um, because we have better technology in the field to keep them alive longer. We've been in a war longer than we've ever been in our country. And so that groups like that don't, don't get that money. And so it's not just, it's, it's so exponential when you think about it. And when you talk about convention centers, you know, convention centers don't get rented by anybody, they get rented by people who are doing events or exhibits. Hotels, mm-hmm. by and large, get booked mostly when people are in town to do business or to be attend an event. Um, yeah. You know, when when there is a citywide in Washington D.C., let's say the Dental Association, you know, you look at all of those uh, businesses that actually benefit from that one meeting um, or three days of meetings, but a one gathering. It's huge, and for us, just Telling that and putting those numbers to those statistics or people behind those statistics, that's when people on the Hill kind of are like, oh, I haven't really thought of it that way. Oh, wow. I never realized when you cancel or how many like we had our our coalition had everyone do an ecosystem survey so that when you look at an event that takes place for 3000 people day alone, we had 1,500 people who were staff for that day, that that security catering. That did not include what it took the six months before. Mm-hmm. And those kinds of stories start to tell this, this really layered um, uh, 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 industry that we are. Yeah. Not, not Phil- even to mention. Go ahead, Sue, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, and Philip brings up a great point with the associations, right? When you think about, I mean, if, if, if COVID didn't exist, I mean, the medical associations and these doctors from around the world who can come and researchers can come together and come up with solutions. All of that has been removed. We have data that shows 74% of associations rely on their events, annual meetings first for revenue. We have data that shows, um, I've seen some data that show that it's a 
Forty percent of their annual operating budget is is derived from these events on average. Um, it's second to membership. In some cases, it's more than membership in terms of what they're able to generate in order to invest in research and development and all the great work that the association exists to do on behalf of its members. Um, so on whatever vector you look at, whether it's business and economics, whether or not it's research and innovation, whether it's not, whether it's social, um, you know, we just have such an exponential impact through all, all, all aspects of, of, of the economy. It's, it's just, the, the it's hidden, huge. The hidden side is the social physics of how, when you go to events, ideas flow. Yep. And we don't yes. have a clue of all of the things that are happening between people because they magically yeah. meet at these events and, and form the, new businesses and change and that the world. is the number one thing that we're hearing that people don't like about virtual events they're like well virtual you can just do it online right and it's the serendipity you don't yeah. run into philip you know in the hallway that i hadn't seen in a few months and get caught up and say oh my god here's a fantastic idea we need to work together well and it's i will say uh back to my old days being a social secretary how much effort and time we put into seating a table, yes. right? Yeah. How on behalf of the vice president of the United States, who is there, there is a state visit for business and diplomatic purposes, but there's so much commerce and ideas and technology and innovation that comes out of those or came out of those events. That was a, a while back. Um, and so we spent a lot of time deciding who was going to be with each other and what conversations could be sparked and that you can't do virtually. Um, right. And, and I, I do believe we're going to be back at a place where events Live events are going to be you know, going to happen again. Um, but those are the things that are being missed. I think people are going to crave are going to crave in-person uh, meetings. And I think for us and what we're trying to do as a coalition, and we have 22 state coalitions now, maybe close to 25 around the country that are, are doing the same work, but in, on their state levels, is if we don't get this help from Congress, if we don't get a restart act, if we don't get PUA, if we don't get PPP, you're going to see a lot of vendors who are not going to make it through this period. Um, and I think about a lot of the caterers. I think about a lot of the small florists. I think about, you know, the, like the, the audio visual vendors who have huge warehouses full of equipment that is just sitting right now. And so if, if you look at what that impact is going to be, if we don't get this help, it's, it's not going to be good. And so we're doing another, I know we did the empty event activation, David, that you saw and Sue, you saw that we did on the wall that tried to help people understand. We're doing another one in partnership with some other organizations called Red Alert, yep. uh, which is either going to happen on the 1st or the 8th. They're not sure yet, but it's yep. going to be buildings red all over the country, venues that normally would have events to, to do a Red Alert spotlight. So Congress will say, okay, hopefully, oh, got it. This, this industry really is big. This industry really is the lifeblood of so much economic power, so much creative power, so much innovation. We have got to make sure they survive this pandemic. Okay, so let me ask the final question because I know we're a little tight for time today. Uh, we're asking people to talk to their congressmen, to talk to their influential people that they know in their lives. You know, does a robo letter work in the old firm? A robo letter, I guess I'm dating myself. Does if you're does does it really matter? How do you get people to say, I count and I'm doing something important if I'm just copying a letter and sending it? Why is that important? And why should we take the time to do that? So you, you join the letter we're doing um, totally works. You know, in the old days, as I mentioned, when I worked on the Hill, when I was at the White House, you know, we would they would sometimes to make an effect to show us how many letters they bring in the big boxes of letters. Right. And dump them on the on the table. Um because they pay attention to those. And it doesn't matter that it's the same letter that we generated for everyone to sign on to. It's the numbers. It's so, the numbers. so the number, it's like it, the whole game. It's no, no one's going to read your letter. Well, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't, I don't know that. I don't know that that's fair. I mean, because we, we did, we did a grassroots campaign. We had over 1400 letters that were sent. We had, we had constituents specifically from their state, so it matters. So obviously somebody in Texas writing to Cruz or 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 Cornyn is gonna make a, a better difference a bigger difference potentially, right? So we did that. We had state specific facts so that we could personalize it um, for that state. And yes, we had to do it on mass, but we got feedback, you know, somebody liked a tweet, <laughs> a legislator from from a representative from one of the states like somebody's tweet. So I think um, I think it can, you know, 
I, I totally agree. You have to have the volume, but I think the technology exists in such a way that you can, and, and, and the coalition and the reach is so big um, on all, you know, on all parks, you know, 20, you got 22 in states. I mean, that's huge activation. Um, it, it, it can make, it can make a real difference. And I do think legislators will pay attention or are paying maybe, attention. Maybe, uh, Philip, maybe you want to explain in an office, there are people that professionally are hired to read these things and to, and to so, do these constituent services. So the most important position, if, if you're a good member of Congress or if you're a good senator, um, it likely, uh, you know how important it is to pay attention to constituent services, right? And and that's a whole plethora of things from our bridges don't work, the, the this is not working in our district or state. Um but you have people in those offices whose full job, full time job is to literally respond to all of this mail and all of these letters. Um, and, and usually they're overseen or part of a, of a team that also has a has a legislative affairs person. So they're very familiar. So when we go into an office, we usually talk to the legislative affairs person about what we need. And then the pressure comes when all of these constituents and all of these grassroots letters start to come in. And then that, that team in the office, the letter folks then go to the legislative they'll want to know at a staff meeting every day how many letters did we get today and what were they about right it, when i was there i'm sure it's somewhat similar now and the, and that person overseeing all of the correspondence in the office will say we got 5000 letters today about the restart act we got 1500 letters today about the capital or whatever it is and so they really pay attention to those um and and it's just a different form of transmission than it used mm-hmm. to be Um, But they're important and tweets are important. And as Sue said, we're about to start a whole new huge tweet campaign around the specific period between now and when they come back. So look at that. And Sue, we should talk because you guys could be a part of that same tweeting, even though um, your interests are slightly different. We're all in the same big umbrella. We're all in this together. So, yeah. Yeah. The wedding industry, which, you know, I don't typically do really. I don't do weddings. You know, they're a billion dollar industry alone. Um, And that's just one vertical. And so I think. Um, David, to your point, it does. People sometimes I know. Right, what, how am I going to make a difference? It's like voting, right? I don't know how to make a difference. You will. You, you, you've got to really understand what this means to people um, and what their livelihood, how, how their livelihood and their lives depend upon um, this industry surviving this. Right. And Sue, you said earlier that you haven't been in the advocacy business long. We are now are all in the advocacy business, whether we like it or not. Yeah. And learning these nuances, I think our people think a congressman is sitting in his office alone, you know? Well, uh, and, so and, and I think I it's have important say, for us to have these kind of conversations. Absolutely. You guys want to tell us how to get involved. Um, uh, and we'll put it in the show notes as well. But how do you get involved with your organizations? So if people can go to liveeventscoalition.com, um, there's several ways you can be involved. One is membership, which is really important for us because it helps build our numbers. And there's very various levels of membership. There's individual. I know it's a hard time to ask people for money, um, but it really helps us continue this work. So that's one thing. On the same website, you can find the, the you start or you join, sorry, letter. I go back to my old days of joining. Um, that, those are really important. Follow us on social media, the, the, the uh, Twitter campaigns that we're going to be doing and the Instagram campaigns, um, research, understand what your who your local officials are. You'd be surprised the number of people who don't know who their congressperson is. They might know their senators, but they may not. Um, but educate yourself on that and understand that we're only as strong as all of us in this industry, and we're only as strong as the people in the field out in each city and each state. We need all of us to come together to really make this impact and make people understand, help people understand who we are. Sue? Yep. And on our end, um, go live together.com. Um, click join us. Um, there are no membership fees. We are not an association. We are um, a coalition. Um, you know, we, we were um, uh, thankful enough to have some very generous donors to, to be able to help us with the advocacy work, um, you know, understanding kind of what the times are. Um, but that's the easiest way to be able to get the newsletters and understand where, where things are going. You know, we do have we have links to the Live Events Coalition on our website. We have resources. We have a lot of the impact data. 
um, together with some of our coalition partners, similar to your case studies. You know, we had some videos that were created to really humanize some of the bigger facts that we have um, to tell our story. Because at a certain point, like I get overwhelmed by the numbers and I'm the one who's, you know, coming up with them and living in this industry, right? Yeah. There's this great little story, you know, it's just this great little story of this little, this, this family who, 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 who created this product and showed it at a show and they were successful. And that just, I mean, that makes you feel good about what we do as an industry. So, you know, all of that and, 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 and some of the activations with the empty tables, like it makes it real, like it, it, it personalizes it. So it's really important. So, Yeah. And one last thing, David, I, I would say this, the thing that we have in our, we have such power in the fact that we are conveners of people, right? Everyone has an event that has meant something to them, either professionally, personally, emotionally, everyone relates to an event, right? At some event in their life, whether it's a wedding, a graduation, a concert, a gala, a, a, a place like the family that Sue just talked about, an exhibit or convening where they were able to sell a product that you know really meant a lot to their family and, and really made their lives better. Um, so that's the power we have. And I think sometimes people forget that. Um, and what I'd also say is, and you may mention this in the intro, I'm not sure, but neither the Live Events Coalition or Go Live existed before the pandemic. Right. right? We came about because we realized, oh my gosh, and in D.C., we formed a coalition very quickly amongst me and several of my competitors who really started talking about how are you going to handle your event with cleaning and stuff before there was a shutdown. And then once the bottom fell out, we found it even more critical to talk with each other. We opened it up to everyone in our industry and we have you know calls once a week. We're on a vacation right now for the summer, but um, where we have sometimes 300 people join on a weekly basis to talk about things like as basic as insurance, what to do about insurance. Um, reopening, we're engaged in, like in DC, we're very engaged with the mayor's office about reopening, what that looks like in events. Um, so the community is coming together. And I think we just have to stay together stronger and, and stay big. So I think that the, just uh, this conversation alone shows how the industry is one industry and that, it, that we are doing such similar things that it is totally important to get these messages out. And and the fact is that, you know, what I believe that leadership is the secret sauce in success and that if you get involved today, yes, you're helping the cause, but you're creating relationships with people that will last a lifetime. Mm -hmm. and, it, and if there's one way to help each other is to get to know each other for the future. Yep. So with that said, I thank you guys so much. Um, thank you. This David. is, you know, our, our, uh, you know, our industry is, is empathetic as all get out. And we really care about our attendees and our suppliers and everyone else. And it's so wonderful to be in this kind of industry. So thank you guys. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, Google Play, and Pocket Cast. Be sure to leave us a rating and review. It helps others discover the Gather Geeks podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can leave feedback on Twitter at Gather Geeks or leave us an email gathergeeks at bizbash.com. We hope you join us again for the next episode of Gather Geeks. Until then, gather on.